by uh, the, the GAFCON Primates Review of the Constitution and Canons of the Churches of the Anglican Communion, principles of canon law underlying and common to those churches, and consultation with other canon lawyers from churches and the Anglican Communion. I want to give particular uh, thanks and credit to <coughs> Chancellor Robert Tong of the Diocese of Sydney, who sat with us and helped us draft much of what we have in our current constitution and canons. The task force also drew heavily from Dr. Norman Doe's Canon Law in the Anglican Communion, a worldwide perspective as a primary reference. The task force submitted its final report and introduction to the proposed constitution and canons of the ACNA, including Title IV of the Canons on Ecclesiastical Discipline prior to the inaugural assembly of ACNA uh, in June, actually July 2009, here in, uh, in Dallas. And with respect to ecclesiastical discipline, the task force cited the biblical foundations for church discipline, and I quote from their introduction, the church has the right and the obligation to impose godly discipline upon itself. Our Lord set a pattern of discipline in Matthew 18. The main purposes of church discipline are to protect the flock, to redeem the fallen, and to maintain good order. And the canons include a separate title for ecclesiastical discipline, which is designed to provide a framework for godly church discipline that advances these biblical purposes. The task force then cited the historical traditional foundations for ecclesiastical discipline. And again, I quote, the offenses listed in Title IV, Canon II, we call them the array, uh, these are important and have solid historical basis throughout the Anglican communion. At the same time, the order of offenses listed is specifically designed to emphasize the fundamental purposes of protecting the flock, avoiding abuse of power, and redeeming the fallen. And that is why the first charge for which one may be presented under uh, the array, under uh, Canon 2, is apostasy from the Christian faith, secondly, heresy, false doctrine, or schism, and then third, violation of ordination vows. Now, having cited these and gone on in classic Anglican fashion, these biblical and historical traditional foundations, the task force referred to reasons born of recent experience with the ecclesiastical discipline of the Episcopal Church. And so, and I quote, the recent unfortunate experiences of many clergy with the abuses of disciplinary matters in the Episcopal Church may offer the temptation to restrict a new system unwisely. As with any system of laws, the approach to its administration will bear witness to whether or not there is a commitment to fairness. To this purpose, section four uh, of uh, the array of offenses, conduct giving just cause for scandal or offense, includes the abuse of ecclesiastical power. That comes out of our experience with the Episcopal Church. We are grateful to uh, Alan Runyon and Mark McCall for their outstanding work that they did in analyzing the changes to the canons of the Episcopal Church and their revisions to Title IV, which were uh, monumental changes actually in the actual polity of the Episcopal Church. The task force was mindful of those changes uh, that happened in 2009 in the Episcopal Church to its Title IV ecclesiastical disciplinary canons, and those changes included the removal of procedural safeguards for accused clergy, the broadening of offenses under the overbroad and ambiguous purpose of, and I quote, protecting the welfare of the church and concentrating authority in the presiding bishop not only to be directly involved in the charging process, but also in the direction of those decisions and outcomes thereby fundamentally altering the metro-political authority of the presiding bishop and the very polity of the Episcopal Church itself. For all these reasons and more, the Governance Task Force consciously sought to return 
ecclesiastical discipline in the ACNA to its Anglican roots, biblical, historical, traditional, and in conformity with elementary concepts of natural justice, due process, and fairness. And so, in Canon 1 of Title 4, the church has its, and I quote, the church has its own inherent right to discipline the faithful who commit offenses. Penalties are established only insofar as they are essential for repentance, reformation, and ecclesiastical discipline and order. Therefore, the purpose of ecclesiastical discipline within the church is threefold. Repentance, reformation, and uh, ecclesiastical discipline and order. Note that that is a very different framework from the secular forms of discipline, civil or criminal, that we have been accustomed to practicing within and must be borne in mind as we think about ecclesiastical discipline. This echoes the fundamental purposes of discipline cited by the governance task force in its introduction and overview to the canons, protecting the flock, avoiding abuse of power, and redeeming the fallen. I want to quote from the Church of England 1954 report of the Archbishop's Commission on the Ecclesiastical Courts, the purpose of church discipline, which is to make better disciples. I think that's if, uh, rather serendipitous that we are here and the chief theme of this provincial assembly is discipleship. And there's a root connection between discipline and discipleship. And so uh, the Church of England 1954 report said discipline in the popular mind stands for the maintenance of good order, the observance of rules, and that rather for their own sake. There is not much purpose beyond the order and the observance. Church discipline means a great deal more than this. The true meaning cannot be adequately appreciated unless we think of it in terms of Christian discipleship. Through its courts, the church exercises discipline over the disciples of Christ in order to make them better disciples. In order to make them better disciples. The sentences which its courts pronounce have a twofold aim. Firstly, the bringing of a disciple of Christ who has failed in discipleship to a sense of spiritual realities by making him do a suitable penance. And think here, admonition, inhibitions, and possibly conviction and sentencing. Secondly, where the disciple is an officer of the church, removing him or her from office so as to prevent him or her from being a hindrance to others in the path of Christian discipleship. The purpose is, yes, to redeem the fallen, to make better disciples of ACNA clergy subject to the discipline of the church. And the evidence for this is within Canon 4.1 itself, as well as the definition of the clerical offices in Title III. And particularly, we want to recollect a couple of uh, canons. Number one, going to Title II, Canon 8, Section 1, that all clergy must be exemplary. Highlight the word exemplary in their character and conduct. Under Canon 3.2, Section 2, concerning the requirements for deacon according to Holy Scripture, to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain, and one who holds the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience, tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as a deacon. Title III, Canon II, Section Three: requirements for a presbyter in addition to the qualifications for a deacon and in accordance with Holy Scripture, a presbyter must be above reproach, not self-pleasing, but self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined, temperate, hospitable, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, not a recent convert, one who loves what is good, and one who has a good reputation with outsiders. Canon 3, or I'm sorry, Title 8, Title 3, Canon 8, Section 1, concerning the requirements for a bishop. 
to be a shepherd who feeds the flock entrusted to his care, an overseer of the flock called to propagate, teach, and uphold, and defend the faith and order of the church willingly and as God wants him. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to his care, but a wholesome example to the entire flock of Christ. As our own first archbishop said, there shall be bishops in the church. They shall not be prophets. They will be shepherds and guardians of the flock and the order of the church. And so repentance and reformation, you know, these are not the language of punishment nor even of curbing abuses. They're the words of personal transformation which speak to the vocation, character, and actions of the clergy subject to discipline. But these canons, which provide a profile of what true discipleship should look like for deacon, for presbyter, and for bishop, help us understand the quality that we need to aim for and that is underlying our disciplinary system. The array of offenses that we have in Title IV, Canon II, has solid historical basis not only from the Church of England, but across the majority of other churches in the Anglican Communion. Those seven core offenses are, in descending order, uh, are actually in, uh, in order, 